I'm about to say a sentence that is probably the worst thing ever uttered by me on this channel. This monster will straight up murder you in the most gruesome way imaginable by kissing you on the forehead. Hello and welcome to Monster of the Week, the only show on the internet that takes your favorite old school D&D monsters and dives into their lore, ecology, and ultimately converts them into 5th edition. Today's monster is nothing short of terrifying, after all, terror is in the monster's name. Easy there, pal! Some of us are trying to make YouTube videos over here. This is the Shrieking Terror. It's a starfish-like five-headed flying aberration with a massive wingspan and a thirst for blood. Very cool. It should come as no surprise that the Shrieking Terror is a creature completely created for the sole purpose of waging war, and they fulfill that purpose exceedingly well. It was originally printed as part of Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 in the Monster Manual 3. And it's probably the most aptly named creature in the entire book. The Shrieking Terror hails from the prison plane of Carceri. What a f***ing surprise. This is your fault, isn't it? Don't, don't give me that look. Get the f*** out of here. Quit just bringing your friends around the studio. <laughs> this guy stars in the most viewed Monster of the Week video and suddenly thinks he runs the place. I feel like it should be pretty obvious just by looking at this creature that the Shrieking Terror isn't a pleasant being to hang out with. In fact, I would go as far as to say it's pretty much the worst. It is one of the select few monsters that actually shows the creature killing someone in the artwork and anytime you see that, you know you're in for a wild ride. This monster also falls into the category of hybrid monsters such as the Owlbear or Thessal creatures in that it is born of magical experimentation between two already existing monsters. In the case of a creature like the Owlbear, things are pretty simple. You take an owl, you take a bear, you cast some magic on them, bada boom bada bing, you yeah, got yourself an Owlbear. So what two creatures could possibly be combined to make this horror show a reality. See if you can guess. Who is that? Dungeons and Dragons monster. It's Part one of our Shrieking Terror biology equation is going to be the Vargul. A while back, I did a video where I said the Vargul was one of the goofiest looking monsters in D&D, and I still stand by that statement. But as goofy as a flying head with bat wings might look, they are pretty vile creatures. They of course contribute their heads and wings, which I guess is all they really have to offer to the Shrieking Terror, but what creature could possibly make up the other half? Any of you that guessed the Roving Mauler are absolutely incorrect. It's the Hydra. The other creature used to create a Shrieking Terror is a Hydra. Sorry folks, the Roving Mauler, still useless. This combination of flying heads and multi-headed monstrosities gave rise to a truly terrifying aberration, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Today we're going to talk about just exactly what makes the Shrieking Terror so terrifying by going over its abilities, building an encounter, and then of course going over its lore and inventing a few plot hooks. As always, there is a 5th edition conversion of this monster in the description below, so if you think this creature sounds neat and you want to check it out and maybe run it at your table, everything you need is right down there. Also, if you find this video at all helpful or entertaining, please leave a like, leave a comment, all that stuff helps out tremendously. Now make sure you've got your PPE ready because it is time for... The Shrieking Terror clocks in at a challenge rating of 9. This thing is a total nightmare for so many reasons, but let's just take a gander at the old stat block from top to bottom. Its hit points, armor class, and general stats are nothing insane, but overall they're pretty good. Something you'll notice here is that the Shrieking Terror has absolutely no damage or condition immunities. In fact, it doesn't have any resistances at all. That's because the Shrieking Terror doesn't need to have any resistances because it truly does not give a shit. It's not here to avoid damage, it's here to make its enemies indistinguishable from a fine salsa. It has the same head-related traits as the Hydra from which it is partially spawned, meaning that all these heads can be cut off, but if the neck wound isn't sealed with fire damage, two more heads are going to sprout out on the following turn. Huh, I wonder what it uses all these extra heads for. Well, if you guessed biting the living shit out of everything around it, you'd be correct. 
It has as many bite attacks as it has heads, which is typically going to be five. But if it's up against a group of careless enemies who aren't using fire, that number is going to increase pretty damn fast. It also gets a number of reactions equal to the number of heads it has. So if you get up close and personal to this thing, retreating without using your entire turn to disengage is a tremendously dangerous option. That's on account of all the heads biting you as you try to flee. Another really fun thing about the Shrieking Terror is that its bite contains a non-zero amount of neurotoxin, which reduces the hit point maximum of anyone who gets bitten by it by the amount of damage which they receive. In other words, if you get bit by this thing and you fail your constitution saving throw, you're not gonna be able to get those hit points back until you take a long rest, even if you're drinking healing potions or have a cleric or whoever casting healing magic on you. That means healing up those lost hit points like a Skyrim character pausing combat to eat an entire wheel of cheese is not really an option here. Not even remotely. Eating cheese does nothing to cure flesh wounds. I'm sorry if you're finding out this way. But alas, the party isn't going to be terrified of this thing, at least not yet. Because after all, they're a group of steadfast adventurers who have surely seen much worse. But... Have they heard worse? Because this thing isn't just a terror after all, it's a shrieking terror, and shriek it doth do. The shriek of a shrieking terror is a sound which I like to describe as a combination of nails on a chalkboard and your parents saying they're not mad just disappointed. Anyone that hears this baleful cry must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or become paralyzed for 2d4 rounds. That's 2 to 8 rounds, also known as a shit ton of time, to potentially spend frozen in fear while your friends are being devoured by a multi-headed flying shrieking terror before your very eyes. But it gets so much worse. I'm about to say a sentence that is probably the worst thing ever uttered by me on this channel. This monster will straight up murder you in the most gruesome way imaginable by kissing you on the forehead. That's right, the Shrieking Terror can make a kiss attack against a stunned creature which causes a wee baby amount of necrotic damage. 1d4 to be exact. And if you receive a smooch from the Flying Nightmare Starfish, you have to then make a saving throw. Fail that save and you are stricken with one of the most vile afflictions D&D has to offer. This curse manifests in four stages, which I will now do my best to outline for you. Stage one. Roll 1d6. Over the course of that many hours, all of your hair falls out. Wow. Stage two. Roll another d6. Over the course of that many hours, your ears will grow into long leathery wings and tentacles will sprout from your scalp and chin. Also, all of your teeth fall out only to be replaced by razor sharp fangs. Stage three. Another 1d6 hours later, your intelligence and charisma score are cut in half down to a minimum of three. Hope you didn't enjoy being charismatic or not being a total dumbass because now you're neither. Stage four. The final d6 roll determines how many hours you have left to live. Once that time is up, let's just say that your body is no longer attached to your head. And we'll just say that your head is now a Vargul. Talk about the kiss of death, am I right? <laughs> the super cool thing about this is while the Shrieking Terror does of course get to make a bite attack for every head it has on its turn, it also gets to make a kiss attack for every head it has on its turn. Meaning that if it has five heads after a good old fashioned eardrum bursting shriek, it can then come in and kiss up to five stunned enemies, potentially dooming them to the worst makeout session ever. It can also mix and match those attacks, so much like a kinky date night, there's going to be a tremendous combination of kissing and biting happening. So. How do we build an encounter with this thing? Well, for starters, don't do it. Do not do this to your players. They're probably nice people just trying to play a fun role-playing game with their friends, so maybe you should be nice to them in kind. Nah, I'm just fucking with you. This is, this is what we're gonna do. 
The Shrieking Terror has a 40 foot fly speed, so swooping down on an unsuspecting group of enemies is always a great opening play. Having this creature ambush the party with a shriek is going to immediately put a hold on a few of them, and then the next round should be focused on trying to smooch as many paralyzed targets as possible. Not only will this confuse and confound the players, it's also going to be extremely effective in making sure their heads are no longer attached to the rest of their body. If it's able to get most of the players to fail their saving throw against the kiss attack, it might just straight up leave. That will definitely leave your players dazed and confused, but grateful, at least until their hair starts falling out. If you want to make this fight extra spicy, pair the Shrieking Terror with something else that has a paralyzing attack. Immediately Chules come to mind, but if you want to send a very strong message to your players, maybe just send a Mind Flare after them with a Shrieking Terror mount. Imagine this thing swooping into combat with a Mind Flare riding on its back, holding its wand aloft, ready to cast who knows what spells. I do. I know what spells. For starters, we're going to talk about Hold Person. If the Mind Flayer in question casts Hold Person on someone, that immediately sets up the Shrieking Terror to then dive bomb on top of that target and play the worst game of Spin the Bottle with them ever. Now that's a powerful way to open combat. Just make sure you have some extra cash lying around to pay for the therapy your players will most certainly need after this campaign is over. Speaking of Mind Flayers, in Eberron lore, they are actually the ones responsible for the creation of of the first Shrieking Terrors. But I suppose that's a topic for outside of combat, so maybe it's time to move on and talk about a few. This idea that you should take two already kind of horrific creatures and combine them into an unholy fusion abomination of a monster just reeks of power mad wizard shenanigans to me. It's that classic problem of only thinking to ask yourself if you can do something and not if you should do something. We can make toothpaste and orange flavored ice cream, but should we? This ideology of doing weird experiments on powerful monsters just to see if you can is the basis of this entire creature's existence. And that should inform you of its place within the world at large. A spellcaster, alchemist, or even just a scholar of weird science is gonna be behind the creation of this thing in your world potentially, and having it be an escaped experiment could be a perfectly fine one-off adventure. A classic monster hunt where the party has to go after this bizarre aberration that's been cited wreaking havoc on the countryside. As I mentioned earlier, looking at the lore in the source book, these creatures come from the prison plain of Carceri. I've covered so many monsters from Carceri at this point, and I'm sure all of you guys know what Carceri is, but for those folks who haven't seen like 10% of my videos. Carceri is a giant cosmic prison where gods banish horrible creatures they either can't or won't kill for some reason. Everything there sucks and should just never be allowed to leave. I guess that's how prisons work. If you can believe it, that's the place the Shrieking Terror calls home. They are used as weapons of war by demons and other extremely powerful and foul creatures who possess magic strong enough to either create them or dominate them. Specifically, the book mentions Demodans, also known as Geraliths, as being their masters. But I'm sure we'll explore a little bit more of that when we actually do a video about Demodans in the future. Because you know I'm going to cover Geraliths on this channel, are you kidding me? The takeaway here is that Shrieking Terrors are used as weapons of war by powerful entities. So if your party finds themselves opposing an evil aberration, fiend, demon, devil, any type of powerful evil outsider really, there's a good chance they might encounter a shrieking terror under the employ of said evil being. The final detail I want to mention here is that the book does mention Varghuls having a sort of polarizing opinion about what the Shrieking Terror is and how they should be treated. Some Varghuls hate Shrieking Terrors and will swarm and kill the creatures on sight if they can. They see them as horrific abominations of their kin. And to these Varghuls, I would say, look in the mirror, dog. Like, 
You've got your own shit going on. But I mean, Varghuls aren't really that smart, so stands to reason. The other opinion found amongst Varghuls is that of reverence. Some of them worship the Shrieking Terrors and view them as a sort of apex form, an ideal to strive towards. They want to be Shrieking Terrors, and in some cases might even offer themselves up as components for the creation of new Shrieking Terrors, hoping to live on in a new form. If you're a powerful spellcaster that's making Shrieking Terrors, and you have a bunch of Varghuls who are willingly wanting to become the thing that you're creating, that's a pretty sweet setup. I mean, you've got a wizard out here who's just commanding hordes of Varghuls, which is already pretty awesome for them, and then they're using these minions to go out and capture hydras, and then selecting a few lucky flying heads to become part of that hydra's form, thus creating a new Shrieking Terror. That sounds like a great way to control a region through fear and force if you ask me. And where there's a tyrant commanding multi-headed monsters, there must also be a group of adventurers out to stop them. Enter the party. But however you choose to use this monster, the Shrieking Terror is exactly what its name suggests it to be, and it's most certainly going to leave an impression on your party. If you do want to use this monster, as I mentioned, there is a 5th edition stat block conversion in the description down below. And if you are one of my incredible patrons, you will of course find the 5th edition monster manual style stat block over on the Patreon page. If you're not already a patron, please consider checking it out because your DM folder will be swaggier than ever with all these fancy new stat blocks, and it also helps me keep the lights on. I'd also like to introduce our new segment, Patron of the Week. Going forward, every episode I will be giving a random patron a special shout out and making a dad pun out of their name if possible. Gotta use my dadly powers somehow. So this week, I want to thank Chris Bishop for being a patron. Thanks, Chris. I'm sure you'll make Cardinal very soon. Thank you guys all so much for watching. I do appreciate it a ton, and I will catch you in the next episode. Until then.